good morning so, or rather good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, today we have this uh, talk with some really, really, uh, I could say, we couldn't have chosen better experts on this field <laughs> about talking t uh, about corporate collections, which is a very, very broad subject indeed. So I imagine uh, the only way to go through this topic is actually to hear directly uh, from them, uh, their experience uh, in institutions they work in, and to start uh, our debate. We have Silvia Eibmeier, who is an art historian and a member of the Board of Contact, which is uh, connected to the Erste Bank uh, here in Austria. Uh, we have Grazia Quaroni, who is the senior curator of the Fondation Cartier in Paris, and Joe Vickery, who runs the, inter the, is the international director for Russian art at Sotheby's uh, in London. And uh, perhaps I would like to start uh, with uh, Grazia, who uh, has... Uh, the Fondation Cartier is possibly uh, one of the first uh, and one of the most important uh, corporate uh, collection uh, in the world. But uh, I think one of the, the interesting thing about it is also that it's based in France, which has, on the other hand, a very strong tradition of uh, uh, national, of public institutions. Uh, the state is very strong in uh, uh, the management of uh, culture in, in France. So to have a you know, private corporate collection which somehow uh, uh, works together or, or, or somehow program-wise competes with uh, this very, very strong institution, is, I, I think is a very interesting uh, uh, point. Please. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. So I, I actually do work in Paris uh, at the Cartier Foundation for Contemporary Art. In this very simple name, there is uh, the, the structure of the foundation, which is, uh, uh, which is a private uh, foundation. Uh, Cartier is uh, it's actually the expression of the cultural patronage of uh, uh, a company like uh, Cartier. And uh, the name also says for contemporary art, uh, intending with contemporary art, whatever is any artist who's living in our time and extending the idea of artists to all fields of uh, uh, creation and not only, let's say, painting and sculpture, not only visual arts. Um, the, I think that uh, the two uh, topics of Cartier Foundation is uh, its age. It has been born uh, in uh, 1984. So uh, it has now 30 years of existence. Some of the uh, basic uh, concept of uh, its existence and its uh, programming are today uh, quite uh, normal in the art world, but 30 years ago it was quite new. It was the idea for a company to have uh, a long-term engagement in contemporary creation with a dedicated space independent from the company space, a dedicated collection and a programming and a staff, which was not coming from the company, but from the art world. And the idea of uh, uh, betting on the programming of contemporary art exhibitions and collecting in the same time, it was, uh, the, um, it was the, the affirmation of uh, wanting a long-term project. 30 years later, we can say uh, that, uh, that it, was, uh, it was a winning program and uh, it had uh, a, real, uh, a real influence, let's say, into the, the, the overview of uh, the museums in Paris. So, um, shall we start with uh, some of the images? This Please. is the building uh, built by Jean Nouvel. In, uh, in, the, in the Montparnasse area. And I think it's important just to say that it, 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 we, the Cartier wanted to have a landmark in terms of architecture. And we know how uh, uh, classic architecture is, uh, is important and is, 
and is a, uh, and is an overwhelming in Paris. So breaking the pers perspective of the Boulevard Raspail with a new building, it was already uh, it was already w the first sign of contemporary art coming up. Uh, let's say that the collection today, since we're talking about a corporate collection, uh, counts, uh, let's say, uh, 1,400 uh, different works, any kind, uh, painting, sculpture, photography, but also, but also popular art, also uh, new media, and, uh, and for about uh, 400 artists. This collection is... Uh, uh, strictly linked and built up out of the program of contemporary art exhibitions. So the Cartier Foundation is a private uh, foundation with a very strong public vocation. It has been made for a large public, for a very wide public, and, uh, uh, and it has a place in the list of Parisian museums. As uh, Mr. Codognato said, uh, the patrimoine, uh, the, the public uh, institutions are extremely strong in, uh, in France. And uh, uh, I must say that uh, private foundations are not the counterpoint, but they are uh, complementary. And I think that they, the both public and uh, private, uh, answer to the needs of the artist today. When I say that the collection is very linked to the programming is that there's no fund uh, for the collection. There's not a group of work that we do exhibit in the exhibition spaces, but it's in the other way around. We make a program and out of each exhibition, uh, there is uh, new works, new commissions coming up for the collection. So that means, that means that the collection is something living. It's something like a living uh, organism. And uh, all uh, the works uh, that get into the collection, they, are, they have a story. They have a human story and, uh, and a very lively relationship with the artist that sometimes uh, lasts in the time for years and years. Just to give you some example, this is the current exhibition, which is called Beauty Congo. And it's about, uh, and it's about the, the scene, uh, artistic scene in Kinshasa, uh, with a guest curator, André Magnin. And from here, from painting to sculpture to comics and music, theater and fashion, uh, it's the, only, the, the, the whole scene of Kinshasa that comes uh, into, the, into the Cartier Foundation and into Paris. And out of this exhibition, uh, a, a group of work will get into the collection. Um, from a few years ago, uh, an exhibition called uh, Native Land, having as a guest curator uh, the philosopher Paul Virilio, uh, gave birth to uh, a, a Big, uh, big amount of collaboration. And here you see Exit, a work by Diller and Scofidio, who worked, uh, uh, they are architects, they work with graphic designers, they work with, uh, uh, with a lot of uh, university institutes, they worked on database. It's a work uh, which uh, has to do with new media and with the six topics, the most important one about migration, about uh, financing, about uh, deforestation, about uh, ecological and uh, environmental matters. We are totally into the actuality today, eight years later, but this work is a work that got into the collection and needs to be updated, needs to represent, to present the work as it is, the world as it is today, now. So we are in the process of updating this work which is a sort of map of the world designed by the data themselves, and uh, introduce to the Parisian public again this work. So we go with the collection of the Cartier Foundation into, let's say, new, uh, uh, new, new, new way of curatorial, a new way of conservation of the works. Uh, we still have to preserve uh, paintings and sculpture and photography, but also 
the new technologies, the new uh, challenges of the artist, uh, make us be challenging into the idea of uh, conservation and into the idea on how the works will uh, survive the time and will change and evolve in the time. Uh, this is uh, uh, from, from the same exhibition, Native Land, about, about what's going on today in the world. This is really re extremely actual, and that's how uh, the, all these words will be reactivated. Raymond de Pardon, hear them speak. It is a movie produced by Cartier Foundation, uh, which is about uh, all the languages that are going to disappear in a short time in the world. Um, here is an image from the 30th anniversary of the Cartier Foundation and all the celebration through the collection, because the collection is actually the, uh, the idea of, uh, of, uh, of a history of the foundation, but also the history, the, the, the 13 last years of contemporary art. Uh, popular art uh, is very present also in the, in the collection of Cartier Foundation and bring us to a very important point of the collection and its, uh, its independence from uh, the main Western market somehow. Being uh, in touch with the artists directly and working in commissions and working also in areas, uh, in geographical areas which are not uh, top in the market, bring a, a, a real freedom from the main art market of today. Here again, also the collaborations between the artists are at the heart of the collection because, again, it's a living story and it's a, and it's a living uh, bunch of works and not only objects. Um, so that's the way David Lynch, Guillermo Quitka, and Patti Smith, uh, with uh, uh, Artavas Pelichon, collaborated together for one, uh, one only project, uh, which is an exhibition, and it's also uh, and it's also part of the collection. Uh, the the collection also uh, travels. It travels abroad. It is not really exhibited at the Cartier Foundation since the spaces are limited. Uh, but uh, this is an image of uh, the, the solo show by Ron Muick, presented in Paris and then, uh, uh, and then in many other venues uh, in Buenos Aires, in Sao Paulo. And here you have an image of uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro in the Museum of Modern Art. So. Uh, the collection is exhibited into the Cartier Foundation during the, during the exhibitions, and then it travels uh, in the world under, the, under the, the, the shape of solo shows or the shape of uh, uh, selection from the collection that Cartier Foundation still curates. And as I said, all fields of creation are involved into the program of Cartier Foundation and also then in the collection. And here you see some images of an exhibition about mathematics that brought us in touch with 10 of the most important mathematicians of the world uh, to discover that uh, their uh, goal was not very far away from the ones of the artists. So it was very, very easy for the artists to uh, uh, to approach uh, this uh, shape of thinking and discover that, uh, well, the goal is always to find an order uh, of this world and uh, to try to understand a little bit more about the mystery of, uh, of our world. And the goal is really the same. So, the, uh, so the mathematicians asked the, 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 the artist just to give shape to this common goal. And so that's how the programming and the collection, by consequence, extends to all fields of creation. And here is the architecture conceived by David Lynch in a shape of a double zero, so, uh, and the library of mysteries that has been put up by, by Russian mathematician Misha Gromov, and uh, including the 30 
most important titles of books about mathematics from the antiquity to today. And here is how um, David Lynch uh, uh, put it in a, a, a included uh, the with a with a mathemat mathematic fireplace included the, the library into the scene. Comics with Moebius have been also one topic of uh, the programming, and it's uh, now uh, a very important uh, acquisition in the collection. Takeshi Kitano was mm, very well known to be a filmmaker and not an artist. We discovered uh, that he could make uh, a lot of different uh, creation, and actually this is an example of an exhibition that did not exist before, uh, before it has been put up, so everything has been commissioned. And uh, about solo shows, it goes from photography, special commission to William Eggleston, American photographer, to, to make a new series about Paris. Uh, with, uh, with the piano we put in the show for his uh, comfort, uh, he likes a lot to, to play piano, so, so it was just there for him to uh, it, it had no function for the public, but just for the artist. Um, and this is a solo show by Patti Smith. So again, extending, uh, extending the idea of creativity and idea of, uh, of uh, exhibitions to, uh, uh, to music and to rock and roll. So uh, David, David Lynch uh, he has, is also very well known as a filmmaker. This is just... Uh, just to, to give an idea on how uh, we conceive the idea of contemporary art. When we say Cartier Foundation for contemporary art, it's all this that it's included. And it's all this that comes uh, naturally as a process into the collection. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> and Sylvia, we were sort of talking just before the starting the, the, um, the conversation. And uh, w w one, one, I think one of the most uh, striking uh, things about the, the Erste Bank as a, as a collector uh, is the, that is focus on Central and Eastern Europe, which I imagine is also the area influence of, uh, of, the, of the company itself. Uh, would you like to? Tell us something about this uh, focus and this. Uh yes, thank you. Thank you. I, is it working? It's working. Yes, so at first, um, thank you for the invitation. And I would like to say at the beginning, I am substituting Katrin Romberg, who is, has been the head of the collection since two years. She's in Warsaw. It's very, it's not by chance, I would say that she is opening at the opening of uh, the show of Julius Koller, that's the reason. Julius Koller is an important artist from Slovakia, who is one of the main figures from the collection from the very beginning. Um, the, the story, uh, and I'm also um, uh, substituting Franz Karl Brüller, who is the head of Erste Foundation, I will talk then about the relation between uh, the collection and um, the foundation. Uh, Contact, I mentioned Julius Koller. Contact, the name of the collection, comes from Julius Koller from the 60s, from the 1960s, when Contact, written in German with Ks, with two Ks, was a sort of metaphor for also the need and the conceptual idea of contact with, of course, the other part uh, on the other side of the Iron Curtain. But certainly, a, an aim of the collection is not only uh, producing this contact between the former East and the West, former West, I we call it also the former West now, um, but also between these um, countries from uh, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Southeastern Europe which affect, this hasn't existed before. Uh, during, um, before um, uh, the turn, before the fall of the Iron Curtain, there wasn't so much exchange between these countries. This only happened afterwards. This, for political reasons, certainly. So, 
the idea then to found this collection uh, came from Boris Marte, um, who um, worked for and has been working for the bank um, since longer time uh, to do something, so to say, to uh, uh, produce this contact uh, together uh, with, um, of course, the idea now of the collection. You, we have to reconsider. There were no markets and there was a rather little information in those years, uh, 11 years before there were exhibitions, yes, like after the war uh, in 99 and uh, some others, but mainly uh, the information and the context didn't really exist. Uh, there were no galleries uh, in this southeastern, uh, south, um, uh, eastern European countries, and all these things have changed a lot as we all know. Uh, I would, this was sort of the, of course, this is not to forget, uh, as the bank has expanded into these countries, has bought banks, saving banks, uh, and others in Prague, in Bucharest, in Budapest, in Bratislava, in Zagreb, and those are also uh, those well, who give the money. And of course, Austria, or the Austrian bank gives most of the money to um, uphold and to um, uh, make the things going for the collection. This, um, of course, there are economic interests, this is connected. This is also very much limited, the countries not only, but mainly uh, the uh, artists and artworks in the collection come from those countries where the bank has expanded, but not only, we are extending, have extended that, but there is not are not involved is not, for example, Russia and Ukraine. They are not, um, um, not yet, we could also say, uh, part of this. I want to talk about the structure. The structure is not a typical um, corporate collection, uh, but, uh, and this uh, seems to be very important because we have um, uh, experienced uh, a lot of uh, things that were going on um, in the recent years, how um, properties have been changed, how companies have been changed, or, and, and all these things where uh, the art collections are part of the policy. They have, or they are involuntarily part of the policy. In, um, in the case of contact, it's insofar different because contact is organized as a society from the very beginning. A society with a certain um, uh, statut statutory law. And due to this law, uh, these um, artworks are not a part of the property of the company, of, of the corporation. This means it could never be sold uh, in terms of say, making more money or whatever reason, and be it for a social purpose. This is very important because this, um, from the very beginning, uh, puts this collection into another, I would say, um, conceptual, um, under a conceptual sign or um, idea. And so uh, I would say this is a sort of logic that has also uh, um, that is mirrored in the collection itself, starting with avant-garde art from the 60s, early 60s, onwards up to now, from the countries I mentioned, uh, and Austria. This is uh, the, there are now a few exceptions with two works for different reasons uh, from Germany and from the UK, but the collection co um, contains 99 artists, not 100, 99, but it will soon be different. <laughs> and about 900 artworks. And a third of them um, were um, done in, during the last, say, 15 years. And uh, the other ones from, say, 59 to 89, to make this difference be between the uh, socialist, uh, say, uh, policy or politics and the post-socialist. Um, uh, yeah, era, era well, however we call it. Um, and the idea of the collection is to follow these 
expressions, the ideas, the conceptual ideas, they were certainly, uh, um, um, they were um, kind of, um, now I find, don't find the English word, they weren't forbidden, but uh, they were not... Um, um, Officially. Uh, yes. Sure. Um, the, as I said before, there were no artists, but uh, there were no, um, there was no art market for the for the, the artists. There was no uh, support from the state, but of course, artists organized themselves in very different ways. And this maybe is also an important uh, part of the idea of this collection, to which is always and has been from the very beginning the idea to. Um, do scientific research. It's never only uh, the idea of collecting and assembling works and uh, so on, but to uh, um, foster and um, propose a scientific research which has been done through the years um, and uh, to support specific projects then uh, in the course of the, the whole developments. This, uh, I want to... Um, um, uh, focus, uh, ask you to look at those books. The yellow catalog has been done already in 2006, only two years after the beginning of the collection, with uh, quite a substantial um, um, uh, part of the collection. So we were very lucky in the early years how much we could collect. And um, you have a little leaflet here, a little booklet, where you find a sort of um, small, ex a small um, selection of examples. I must not forget uh, to uh, mention now um, my colleagues in the artistic board. This is part of the structure. From the very beginning, this board has existed until now. This uh, consisting now alphabetically Georg Schöllhammer, curator who is doing now, has uh, just finished the f uh, opening the Kiev Biennale, curator and also publisher of Springerin. Um, Jerzy Szeftig, a curator and professor of art history in Prague. Branka Stipancic, curator and art historian um, in, from Zagreb and Adam Simchik, uh, whom you will know very well, I assume, since long time, and who will be the next, or he is now the design director for the next documenta. So all, all the um, decisions are made within the group, in discussions, every, uh, every member proposes works and we discuss, and that's how the whole process is functioning. And how do you search the, let's say, the works or new artists? Do you have curators in each of these cities, or how? How do you, how do you somehow, you know, sort of choose the works uh, to we, add to the collection? We, uh, this way, somehow we started from scratch, you know. You know I mean, uh, for example, at present, you know, how do you, do you have curators in in these cities, or how do you? This is um, maybe also really important to mention. It's also part of the concept of uh, contact and uh, all these people involved. It's a, it's a huge network that has been developed over the years. And every one of us has his or her networks. And we then uh, propose these artworks. This is, uh, um, yes, over the years. Uh, this develops and develops, and of course, it, we, we could buy much more so if, we, if we had the resources, uh, which have been cut actually for 50% after the crisis in 2011. But another thing I have to mention, and um, uh, quickly, um, since 2012, as the foundation has joined uh, this society, is part of. So, so, so to say, part of the of this um, collection idea, and as the foundation is uh, supporting monographic um, publications on a specific artists, and this is an example you find here as well. That's uh, and also uh, in not only in connection with uh, uh, the collection but also in terms of other projects, these artists are involved or need the money. 
works. And, and, and where are the works exhibited? How do you, how do you present the works? How do, yeah, how do you that's work, another exhibit? important question. Um, uh, this is uh, another really, um, um, say, significant thing about this collection. We call it nomadic. So it's not meant to be on, at one space in one sort of museal context. There is no exhibition space, no steady exhibition space. But this collection is meant to be shown in, uh, of course, never all together, and of course, due to resources in those different countries where the works are coming from. So bringing this, uh, kind, kind of promoting this exchange also between the ideas, uh, the, the people, and these different countries, and of course, uh, political ideas that, uh, in, on the long run, of course, the, the question has um, a political story to tell too, not only an artistic one. And uh, this is maybe to finish then. From the very beginning, uh, this collection has been shown in parts. So uh, first in Vienna and Bratislava, parallel, then in Belgrade, a very large show, uh, then smaller shows in Hungary, Dunavaros, in Sofia, in the city um, gallery in Sofia, in the uh, Austrian Cultural Forum in New York, and n now recently in Pristina in Kosovo. And um, final thing, um, what was that now? Um, no, no. no no, I think this is wha what I wanted to say um, about about uh, the different ways of showing. Yes, of course, now that I have it again. Of course, uh, there are a lot, um, really a lot of loans all over the world. So the, the collection is steadily asked for loans and this is being done all the time. Thank you so much. And Joe. <laughs> For very obvious historical reasons, Russia um, you know, set up a corporation much more recently than, uh, than, most, uh, than most other countries. How, um, you know, the, the, let's say the new, uh, the new economy <laughs> that uh, was sort of the, to, took place after the, the fall of the Iron Curtain and the art collecting went together? Yes, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel. Yeah. I feel a little bit of the dark horse because obviously I don't represent a specific collection, but it is a subject that's very close to um, sort of my heart because I work um, today with major Russian private collectors who are building foundations and large scale um, collections with sort of public um, programs. Um, and, and also I'm a member of the Tate um, Russian and Eastern European Acquisitions Committee, so I'm involved in the kind of discussions um, when, you know, with budget-related sort of acquisitions for an institution, which is obviously very different from, from my work at Sotheby's. Um, you talked about the, the changes um, in the early 90s, you know, the growth of the market economy, and um, I thought maybe I, what I could do is give a little sort of brief history of corporate collecting in Russia, because so obviously it's very, very new and young, um, 25 or so years old. Um, what we saw in the 1990s, um, there was a proliferation of new banks, and the banks themselves were very keen to sort of emulate um, you know, financial institutions of the West, and I think art collecting was something that they really responded um, very sort of naturally to. Obviously in Russia, um, there's a great love of culture um, and a great sort of um, collecting tradition b before the um, revolution. So it was a very natural process. Um, and throughout the 90s, we saw many, many corporate collections um, springing up really from nowhere. Um, most of these were focusing on sort of art from the um, early period of the 20th century, so not contemporary art. Um, and if I could mention one or two of them, I think that Incom Bank really stands out in, in, in its own chapter in the history of corporate collecting in Russia uh, for putting together at the time in the 1990s incredibly quickly uh, an amazing collection of Russian avant-garde and um, sort of non-conformist art. Um, as we know, sadly, what happened at the end of the 90s, um, they went bankrupt and the collection was sold really before the Russian art market had taken off um, and the works really sold rock-bottom prices. Uh, but I think perhaps the most 
sort of interesting point is that the um, one of Malay, which is black squares, one of the four black squares, um, was discovered by the curator of the Inquim Bank collection in um, Samara in Russia and brought into the collection. And then when they sold it, it um, was given by a donator to the Hermitage. So they played a very role, a portrait role in sort of art patronage at the time. And the other um, institution, the other bank that I would like to mention from the 1990s um, is um, in the um, Uni Credit Bank. Um, in fact, they um, have a, they've continued to collect, and I'm just showing you this catalog, which I actually got um, a couple of days ago in Moscow. It's just come out um, of their collection. So they've now been collecting for about 25 years. Um, they focus very much on the early 20th century, which was very typical of corporate collections in Russia, as I said, at the beginning of the 90s, and they've really continued in that vein. Um, so the collection is, is very much focused on 1920s, 1930s, um, or artists that were um, working then, perhaps later works, but artists who were very identified with that generation. And I, I'll keep this here, so if anyone's interested to come up and have a look um, after the talk, they're welcome to do so. If we move on from the 1990s to the 2000s, I think the 2000s are really the big chapter of um, the rise of, of private collections in Russia, the, um, private um, sort of institutional collections, foundations, um, if I name a few of them, um, such as the Iris Foundation um, that Abramovich and Zhukova um, set up and has, you know, supports the work of the garage in Moscow. You have um, the Victoria Art Foundation, another of the great foundations today, which has been um, I think it was created in the, in the mid-2000s. And, and these kind of institutions are really playing a, a role which is very similar to the kind of role that you see in corporate collections in the West, particularly in Germany and Austria, um, where um, you know, there is this huge tradition of um, corporate art patronage. And I think we see those private um, initiatives kind of playing those roles. And obviously, you know, if, if you look in general in, in, in history, you know, some of the greatest collections, public collections in the world today were put together as private collections initially. So in a way, I think what they're doing is very interesting. and It'll be interesting to see what sort of future legacy they leave. But if we talk about corporate um, collections, um, there's really been quite a void um, over the past sort of 20 years since the first sort of flurry in the 90s. Um, and, um, but, but there is one wonderful example, um, which is the Gazprom Bank collection. And I wanted really to dedicate the rest of my, um, the time that I have here today to talk about that collection um, on behalf of Maria Sitnina, uh, who is here today, um, the corporate, collector, uh, corporate uh, curator of that collection. It really is a pioneer in its field and its activities um, cannot be sort of overstated. Um, it um, is a collection which um, was set up only three, three years ago. And um, it has the specific um, sort of task, it set itself, itself the task of representing um, contemporary art in Russia from the 1990s onwards. Um, and this is really no a small feat because as, as some of you who, who, who are very familiar with um, you know, the art situation in Russia will know contemporary art is, you know, it needs more patronage. It's something which is not supported widely enough. Um, so I think what, what Gazprom Bank is doing today is, is, is really incredibly important um, for, for, for young artists. The um, collection sort of takes its focus um, on what I would say two sort of main areas. One is a sort of continuation of the sort of conceptual dialogues, which uh, we see going back to the sort of 1960s and 70s with Kabakov, the Moscow conceptualists. And we see a sort of continuation of those dialogues in contemporary art practice today. And I think one part of the collection sort of represents that. Um, and then the other part, I would say, really focuses on a sort of social political um, post-Soviet reality, I suppose you could talk, you could say, in, in, in Russia um, and, and looking at sort of the social realities and, and documenting those. And I think those are the two sort of main areas I see that the, the collection is, is focusing on. Um, I thought it might be good to have a look at some of the highlights from the collection that I picked out. I mean, there are many. These are ones that I just um, selected. Um, so this, this piece is slightly untypical in that it's by um, a Russian contemporary artist called Simeon Fibersovich, who's really of the older sort of generation of Kavakov. Um, I think he's now in his 70s. Um, but he um, came back to painting after quite a sort of hiatus uh, for many, many years. He stopped, he stopped working, but he's come back. And um, the last sort of five or six years, he's been incredibly prolific. 
And um, this is a piece from a series that he um, has been working on called Moi Dvor, um, which translates as My Yard. And of course, anyone who's familiar with Russia will know that the yard has a very, very sort of special social significance in, in Russia. Um, you know, most, most sort of apartment buildings in the cities are um, built around yards and all the sort of socializing, local socializing takes place in the yard where, you know, um, most of the children play and all people sit and chat and you, we don't really have anything like that in London, but um, you may do here in Austria, I'm not sure, but it's a big thing in Russia. And um, so this, this is really... This is the artist yard. This is um, he paints very much this, this, his own environment um, and his own sort of the, the urban landscape um, around him. And I think what's what's nice here is that the the landscape becomes an extension of the artist himself. He has this very warm rapport with what's happening in his own yard. And, and I think this is a this is just a very very nice example. Um, and a couple of works I wanted to show by Olga Chernyshova. Um, she's really one of sort of Russia's rising stars today. Um, she's really exhibiting very widely on the international scene, and it's great to see some works by her in the Gazprom Bank collection. These are from a series um, that she she did based on a video um, a video work. She she works mainly in video, but also um, does some some sort of work on, on drawing. Um, and these are called reflection from a series called Reflections. Uh, basically um, documenting the experience of walking through the Russian museum and sort of witnessing visitors looking at the art and how they're responding to the art and the sort of, you know, looking at this sort of juxtaposition of, of the old and the new and how, how we as people consume art when we go into, uh, into a museum. And you can see here the sort of shadow of, of a sculpture, a marble bust behind, behind this lady who's obviously... Um, one of the visitors. And this piece here is very different. Um, I think, um, I, as I was saying, that the collection represents a sort of continuation of the conceptual art trends that we saw in, in Moscow in the sort of 70s and 80s. And this is a major acquisition um, for the collection by Yuri Albert, who's a prize-winning um, contemporary Russian artist. He won the Kandinsky Prize, I think it was two years ago. Um, and this piece is called... Um, self-portrait of a blind artist and, and what I find quite witty here and quite amusing is that um, these the, the work consists of I think about 80 panels um, done in Braille which describe paintings by Van Gogh that he described in his letters to his brother so very very sort of thought-provoking and very the typical hallmarks of, of, of conceptual art this piece is uh, one of the um, videos in the, in the collection. The, the, the collection is very strong, particularly on works by female artists, uh, particularly the video, the video section of the collection. Um, and this is by um, Yelena Kovilina, who is um, probably Russia's, one of Russia's most celebrated performance artists today. And this is a, this is a video of a performance um, that she created um, called Equality, um, Egalité. She uses the French, she uses the French title. Um, and really, this is, a, this is a piece which I think we can all relate to, not just um, sort of, it doesn't just relate to, it doesn't just address Russian society, but also equally all societies. I think particularly in Europe, we have this kind of golden dream of this um, utopian feeling of equality, which actually just doesn't exist. And uh, what the artist has done here is she's, um, she's created this sense that there's a false sense of equality in the height of these people who've taken part in this, in this performance, they are all standing on stools which are of different heights um, so that um, they can, when, they, when they all stand together in a line, um, it looks as though they're all the same height, but in fact, it belies the, the reality of everybody is different. We're all individuals. We're all, some, some are taller, some are smaller, and of course, that is a symbol for various different, different um, you know, layers of society that we all belong to. This is, a, this is another work by a female artist um, called Taos Makacheva, who's, who's Russian, but she's very associated with Dagestan because she's a, from Ca Caucasian heritage. And uh, This is uh, um, Gamsutl. It's a video work that she did in a place of um, great sort of archaeological, historical value. It's a, a mountain settlement in Dagestan, which is basically falling into ruin. Um, a beautiful, absolutely stunning, stunning place, which is uh, completely abandoned. 
um, and not looked after at all. But um, she, she did this performance um, here where she... Um, oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, she um, she has, a, has a dancer dressed in black who basically um, moves throughout the space, recreating the sort of movements that warriors, that citizens of this particular settlement would have, would have had, you know, centuries ago, trying to sort of, I suppose, in a way, uh, mine the past and, f and, 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 and looking at the sort of echo, the historical echoes left um, in, this, in this abandoned, um, you know, village settlement. And this is a photograph by Yuri Palman, just wanted very briefly to look at. Um, uh, you know, he is a, an architectural photographer. Uh, this is from a series called North Cher Chertanova, which is an, a region I've never actually had the pleasure of visiting in Moscow. Uh, but it was one of the uh, micro rayons which were built up from the 1950s. I think this dated from the 1970s. Enormous uh, regions of prefabricated housing that was um, built in the Soviet Union and which the majority, I think 90% of the population lived in. And uh, what I find quite interesting today is that Yuri is looking uh, both at the sort of historical legacy of these particular um, regions, but also how they're changing in these days of capitalism, where, in fact, sadly, one might imagine that there might be some more imaginative housing built up, but in fact, that's not the case. Um, they continue to be built uh, with larger and larger houses of, of sort of small hutches, which kind of don't really improve on the, on the, on the um, original urban landscape. So it's, you know, he's talking about the, the, the post-Soviet reality, I suppose, in these, in these photographs. And I just wanted to show you these because I think they're enormous fun. They're by a photographer called Sergei Sapozhnikov. He's very young. He's in his early 30s. Um, he's from Rostov-on-Don, um, from the um, Russian provinces. And this is an area um, where they really suffer in the sort of post-industrial times because um, you can imagine there's great wastelands where there's lots of rubbish and detritus from the old industrial era, which has just been left and abandoned and looks absolutely horrendous. But what he's done is he's making something beautiful out of this, this rubbish that's been discarded. And he sort of finds all these machines and bits of wood and he builds them into these huge constructions which look kind of baroque and rather grandiose. And I just find them quite fun, really. And these are just some examples of those constructions that he's making. And finally, um, quite sort of political and quite sharp, these works, um, there's a series of photographs done um, by, I think, Mikhail Tolmachov, uh, as a young Russian photographer today. Um, basically, what looked like rather pleasant um, landscapes uh, were in fact um, images taken from the press uh, with um, uh, surveillance, uh, what do you call unmanned, those unmanned military aircraft? Uh, drones. Drones, exactly, sorry, thank you, drones. Um, these, these photographs originally had drones in the center, which he's actually taken out of the photograph, and they were published in the press in different publications, but the, the place was not revealed for various reasons. And the artists did research, discovered where they were. The title of the works is actually the place where the photographs were taken. And I suppose he's talking about war and perhaps the inhumane face of war today. There's no one manning the, these aircraft, but, you know, it's part of our life in the 21st century. So quite a sort of politically sharp work. So as you can see, I've tried to sort of give you a bit of a a little um, armchair tour of some of the highlights and the sort of range of um, topics and themes that the Gazprom Bank collection covers. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, uh, probably... <laughs> we are running a bit late and I imagine maybe there are some questions from the public, but um, I w if you don't mind, I, I would like to ask you something, which always had this... Uh, as you said, at the beginning of, of collecting and in, in the late 90s, uh, they... Uh, and it's, I, mean, I imagine quite naturally they started collecting art from the Russian avant-garde from the um, 1910s and 20s and 30s, which, by the way, was extremely influential for <laughs> art um, all over the world. Um, is, is that art, I mean, the art of that period, still collected in, in, in Russia or, or not? Yes, absolutely. Um, the art of the avant-garde, of course, is incredibly popular today. I mean, you just have to look at I can name auction results um, 
from, um, in fact, the last sale at Sotheby's, we sold um, one of the Malevichs, which had been restituted back to the family, uh, which had been the Stedlik Museum, and um, that sold for, I think it was $30 million. Um, so just, you know, it can show you the kind of um, price level that the Russian avant-garde can fetch, and it remains incredibly sought after today. I would say that there is amongst Russian but private... But let's say, are the buyers Russians? Or, or yes, the, the buyers are Russians. Um, having said that, I would say um, that there is a taste, quite a conservative taste in a way, and many of the private Russian collectors today are looking at figurative art, particularly from the, the first years of the 20th century, so sort of modernist paintings, and they have more of a preference for that, ironically, than perhaps avant-garde, abstract avant-garde. Really, thank you so much. Pleasure, it was thank really you. great and illuminating. Okay. One, one, just one um, hint. You are invited to take this little booklet with you. I haven't presented any uh, images, but you find them a very small collection uh, of the selection of the collection in this small uh, white booklet lying here. You're welcome. Thank you.